Well, we've called you all here today for a very important meeting. How not to do it. Are we recording? Are we on? We're live. All our wisdom. Remember that. Just remember when you ask the questions that our wisdom and intelligence is our dump stat. That's so. absolutely correct. Isn't that everyone? Yes. And we will have. <laughs> and we've barely got charisma. And we will have video <laughs> proof of what's going on here. So uh, yeah. you guys may not want all that broadcasted. All right. Well, we gotta we gotta do our intro because this is gonna go on the internet. In several different spaces, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, welcome you guys to Tabletop Nerdcast. This is our first like panel discussion. Uh, I'm not with them. Well, you are, <laughs> he's, he's with us. He's a guest. Uh, we've got a couple of guests with us. Um, Nathan, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do, just briefly? Uh, I am Nathan Key. I am co founder of Forge Audio, which is a podcast network. And uh, we're not associated with not associated, <laughs> uh, but we're really good friends. Yeah. And uh, Percy actually edits our D and D show. It's a D and D five E homebrew, and it's called The Mundane and the Arcane, like on my shirt. And we call it Tomato for short, which is why there's a tomato, because <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> that's how Everybody laugh now. Um, <laughs> and I also host a show with my buddy Jared, who's the other co-founder, and uh, he's the CEO of uh, Forge Audio called High Hungry I'm Dad. So we're both nerdy dads. Yeah. And we, it's dumb, don't listen to it. I'm just kidding, <laughs> <laughs> I don't listen to it. No, we definitely don't listen yeah, to it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We almost won a podcast award this year, but did not. Yeah, how so, long have you been doing D&D? &D? Uh, I've been playing D&D &D for probably four or five years. And I've been podcasting for like three years. So excellent. Uh, so I'm I'm Percy. Uh, I met Rick and Mike at Golem's Gate, uh, a small gaming store up in Stafford, and we started this podcast um, a year ago, a little over a year ago. So we've only been podcasting for about a year, but I've been uh, DMing and playing Dungeons and Dragons since I was 12 years old, which is 18 years ago. Hmm. It's very sad. A long time. That's a long time. It's a long time to be playing D and D. Um, I'm Rick Higgs, and uh, <clears throat> I started in 76 and played the Little Brown book. First came out, you know, first edition, and uh, just first night we were camping and some friends of mine brought it out, never played before, and there's nothing like playing outside under the stars. I highly recommend if you ever get an opportunity, you go on a camping trip, it's a great thing to do, and I was hooked and my mind would not stop. All I could think of was all the possibilities and all that. Um, I'm also a scoutmaster for Troop 631 that a lot of boys from <coughs> from this high school uh, go to. <coughs> Believe it or not, some of them game. So, and uh, yeah, we've been doing the podcast and it's been fun. Hi, I'm John Terry. These guys asked me to sit in because they saw me sitting here. Rick and I have played together a few times. <laughs> Um, I started in 1981. I was at a summer camp and was actually told uh, that I wasn't cool enough because I didn't play. <laughs> um, so I played all the way through high school and all the way through college, and then after I got <laughs> married, that all evaporated for 20 years or so, but I've gotten back into 5e in the last four years or so, and I almost exclusively DM uh, Adventure League these days. I almost never play. <laughs> All right, somebody with the phone. Really? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a standing rule at our table. Yeah, yeah, so. I bet it's the same person beating <laughs> on the it's table. It's always the same guy, right? Yeah, it's it's the same person the table. Table. Yeah, that's why I put the person on All right, I'm Mike Aiello, and uh, I've been gaming since about 86. I took a long time off. Uh, I came back to it when uh, Star Wars came out through uh, FFG and through the narrative dice system. So that's really where my bread and butter is. Is you know I'm not a I'm not a historical D and D player for, you know I I played it back in the day and I play it a little bit now. But you know my uh, my area is over in the Star Wars realm. Yeah. So we kind of just want to open up the table for a Q and A for uh, DM questions, player questions, whatever questions you guys might have, and hopefully between the five of us we can get a satisfactory answer for you guys. <laughs> and if not, we're gonna butcher it really bad. <laughs> Absolutely. I will lie. <laughs> right, you got your hand up over there, loud and proud. What you got? Uh, what was, your, what was uh, you guys' uh, reaction to 5th edition? What was our reaction to 5th edition? 
I'll let you guys who've played the older editions help us yeah, out I, on that one. I've only played 5e, so... Um, I played I played 1st edition, 2nd edition, and then basically quit playing for a long time. So I never played 3rd or 3.5. And then, believe it or not, through Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts, one of the dads, we got talking about gaming, and he was starting a 4th edition campaign. And so I said, okay. And so I started playing 4e, 4th edition, which most people hated. I actually really enjoyed. Um, it was a lot different. And then when 5e came out, it uh, went back a lot more to the basics. It became a lot easier to play. It wasn't as crunchy and it didn't feel as mechanical as 4th edition. 4th edition was, I think 4th edition was de designed to be turned into uh, a big MMO game, online game. And so they made everything that way and it felt like that. And 5e got much more fluid and intuitive. I don't. Some of the things I don't like about 5e is it feels like you end up doing the same things over and over again. Okay, you got your basic spells and you do that over and over again. And um, I didn't like that. I don't like that so much, you know. But we'll see. We'll see where they go. Anybody who's played a warlock knows Eldritch Blast Turret. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed first and second edition. I, like Rick, I didn't play third or fourth. Uh, my son is 30, and he refuses to play anything but 3.5. Um, 3.5 is actually the crunchiest of the editions. More rules than you can shake a stick at, but he really likes it. Um, 5e is very fluid, and it's very simple. I can see the appeal, um, but there's a lot of stuff I miss from first and second edition. Um, a lot, and some of it's really flavor, and some of it is just extra stuff that isn't offered. Um, there's just stuff I miss. 5e, you're more, you're more superhero-y, though. There's so many more options, and there's so much more that a character can do. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of half and half. Yeah. And when I started out, I started out with 2nd Edition Advanced, and it was just... You know, it was, it was a lot of fun, but it st again, it was still kind of crunchy at that point. So for any of you that have ever tried it, Thaco is terrible. We hate it. We won't talk about it again. So, um, I really liked it. I did, too. But well, keep sorry, in mind, at the going, time... But that's on you. Right. That's remember, all there was. Remember, we, we played first edition where every class had its own two-hit table, and that's all that was on the inside of the, of the, the DM screens was each class's two-hit table. Because it makes sense that a fighter should have an easier time hitting something than a wizard should. Yeah, and that a dagger doesn't do as much damage against plate armor as a battle axe, you know? It makes sense. Okay, I didn't say common sense here. I said... <laughs> so, so, we got another question over the same area. Yeah, go ahead. What would you say is, like, your, your favorite... What would you say would be your favorite class to play as? Mm. Like standard, or can we throw in homebrew? I would say playing a Muppet. <laughs> we are never letting your Muppet back at the table. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think my, my favorite class is for sure the lore bard. Um, you know, I, I'm a storyteller at heart, and so uh, I like to play a lore bard. Like, instead of doing music and, and stuff like that, like, my bards are generally storytellers. And so, like, I'll, I'll tell this grand, like, 30 second story of a time that I slayed a goblin king and then and clap my hands when I say I killed him and then thunderclap boom it hits like a whole crowd and so like I make it really narrative and so like I, I really like bringing that yeah. to the table a, a whole lot I really love the lore bard yeah cause I'm a lore bard in our current campaign for the mundane and the arcane and uh, his name's Deacon Bishop <laughs> and uh, he's uh, like he he's loosely based uh, like, anybody familiar with the King Killer Chronicles Okay, well, he's he's loosely based off off of a character from that named Kbo, and uh, this is very fun. It's a, a lot of performance involved as opposed to just like doing music or just doing stories. It's that uh, I can put on like a play or say a monologue, or I can I actually will keep my guitar next to me because I, I am a musician. So I'll actually keep my guitar next to me and we'll pick it up and play it. You know to like. Typically, I'll do some sort of 80s cover, and we'll make the words apply to whatever situation we're in. What do you, so what it's do you super think? Killer. That's Karen Miller, right? Uh, that's Karen Miller, the writer? King, no, Killer? King Killer Chronicles is Patrick Rothfuss. Oh, okay, she's got something that's close to that. Yeah. So what do, you, what do you say, and this is just a question for me to you, Nathan, what is your uh, 
healing word spell look like on that character. <laughs> so whenever I do healing word, Deke will reach out his hand and go, uh, get well soon. <laughs> <laughs> there was one point when I was walking through a crowd. I mean, it was after combat, so it didn't really matter. But I was like, he, it was just walking through a crowd, touching people, going, get well soon. Get well soon. Get well soon. <laughs> so it's, it's fun. You know, I, I just, I enjoy uh, playing rogues and sorcerers are probably my two favorite. And I actually combined the rogue sorcerer and I, just because of the, all the different combinations. For me, it's always about agility, movement, and being able to hurt things from a distance, <laughs> you know? Mm. So, but it, it, I think it just, and I like the role play. And that's something that sometimes gets lost. I highly recommend y'all don't. It's so easy to get into this, the number crunching, min max, and you forget the flavor of the game, you know, and the role playing. And that's one thing fourth edition kind of lost. It became so mechanical. And Adventures League, I think, can kind of lose that a little bit. Um, you don't see people really, you know, put that into it. And the role play is where you really make the connections and where you really have the fun, you know. And so. Don't. Yeah. We're all narrative players, so I mean, none of yes. us are the type that's just going to sit there and roll the dice, grab a phone. I mean, that's that's we see it over and over and over again at tables, and mm -hmm. it's just it kills the table. As opposed to uh, whether we had people sitting here or not at different times, we're over here just cutting up like we would at our own table. So yeah. that's that's part of the fun. Yeah. I think the favorite characters that I have right now are a rogue and a barbarian and a ranger. Um, I shy away a little bit from spellcasters. Just, I, and that's never really been my thing, um, even all the way back in the 80s when I was a kid. I kind of shied away from spellcasters a little bit. I think the biggest difference for me between then and now is that then I mostly played elves and half-elves, and these days I'm all about the dwarves. <laughs> dwarves, all day. <laughs> well, normally I'm the guy that fills in whatever gap we have at the table, because I'm not the, again, I'll tell you, I'm not the seasoned D&D player, but my favorite, just for comical purposes, is really the... Uh, the wild magic sorcerer. Yeah, <laughs> that's so much fun. Have fun with it. As sure. a DM, I would be. I'm truly happy to have any reason to roll on the wild magic table. Yes. <laughs> you had another question for us. So you said you are all like big DMs, like you have experience with it, right? Well, sure. some of us are bigger than others, but hey, <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Calm down. wait a minute, <laughs> calm down. Well, okay. Okay. Shine your head for a quarter. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> ones that either really want to go ahead and go away from the group or like just refuse to take it into like go into like a certain direction and just completely disregard everything you planned. Percy? Um, <laughs> yes. And, and <laughs> hang on. Here's, here's the thing. <laughs> uh, I, uh, notice how he, a, he a answered first. I spent a solid amount of time only DMing and that let me see a lot of players like that. I learned um, very early on in my DM career. Like I said, I've been doing it since I was 12. I DM'd for my brothers in our bedroom um, for forever, and they never went, no matter how big I planned or how attractive I made the story, they always went another direction. Uh, so I learned real early on, like, don't, I don't make a plan. Um, I generally make plot points that could happen anywhere, no matter where players go. Mm -hmm. Um, so, like, I have a list of things. These are what's happening in my story, and whether they go through door A, B, C, F, O, or Z, no matter what door they go through, I'll embellish it how I want and still put that plot point in front of them. So I don't make specific, like, map, like I don't map it out. That's A, that's a lot more work than I want to do. Um, for example, and I was telling Nathan this to the side while we were playing our Tomb of Horrors game. Also, if you have problem players, you can always just take them through the Tomb of Horrors and they won't come back. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I was telling Nathan while we were off to the side uh, during our break that uh, he asked me, they, I'd, I'd put him in front of like a fork and there was a, a red uh, tunnel and a yellow tunnel. He said, what would have happened if we had gone down the yellow tunnel because they had gone down the red one? I said, I don't know. I rolled the dice. The room was random. It didn't matter what tunnel you went down. Like whatever was going to happen was going to happen. Um, and now that's not a GM style that everybody can follow or wants to. That's just my style. So was your like the campaign you were playing earlier, is that like a chaos campaign? Is that a what? Chaos campaign? Um, it's, uh, it, I took, so to prepare for that, I took the Tomb of Horrors uh, in the Tales from the Yawning Portal. 
and I put every room from that into an Excel spreadsheet and had them roll dice to see which room they entered. And but like if you're doing a published campaign where <laughs> there are, you know, a lot of times published campaigns it's just, you know, wide open. So yeah, whatever room you go in, um, but if you're outdoors or outside, then there's all kinds of different variables that can you know get on. And if wild magic gets involved, or you know wands of wonder, or any other kinds of things, or um, swag happens. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> no, see, we no, do wait, we wait. do again. We do a lot of the narrative dice mm -hmm. systems. So a lot of us are very aligned in that, where it's come up with some major plot points and then let the dice dictate what's gonna happen because you have no idea what is about to happen at any given place where a player rolls. Um, so with that, you know, it, it's just, uh, you can run, even if you have a player that wants to run off on their own and do their own thing, hey, let the dice lay where the dice are gonna lay. Mm -hmm. That player is either gonna learn or they're not. Yeah. And it, it kind of, in my opinion, it kind of polices itself because it'll either add to the story or it'll get to a point where that player kind of feels like, eh, I'm not really getting what I want out of this game, right? Um, and, and unfortunately, sometimes with, and, and it is with every table, we've even had people with the podcast that they just get to a point where they're ready for something different. And that's natural from any player. Remember the... Um, in the long run, what you're doing is for them. Mm -hmm. So um, giving them uh, some leeway to go off the rails um, is letting them do what they want to do and have some enjoyment. Okay. Um, now, I run Adventure League, and Adventure League, there isn't a leeway to do that. So it would actually be kind of nice to have a little bit of, of extra. Um, as far as a person that wants to go and be separate from the party and do something else, um, that's not always the worst thing in the world either. I know that everywhere you look on the internet, it says never split the party, never split the party. All you have to do is manage it. Um, what you might do, there's a guy on YouTube named Matthew Colville that's got a series on running the game. He's up to like 85 episodes now. And he has one specifically on splitting the party and how to make it work. Mm -hmm. On how that can be very dramatic and how if, if, the, if things are playing well, the rest of the party won't actually be bored because they'll be engrossed in what's going on there. It's not a terrible thing. Yeah. And, and our Star Wars game actually works that way. So uh, very early on within what we've done on the, the podcast of the Star Wars side, um, what, we've, what, I, what I've worked out with, with my crew here is, is that we'll, uh, each one of them will kind of get a scene. And whoever's within the scene, the scenes last no more than six to eight minutes tops. And it's kind of a quick rotation and you try and find a very high point or a very low point in that narrative story to stop the scene right there and flip it. Because what's gonna happen is you're gonna keep your people entertained with what's happening because they're, they're trying to figure out what's gonna go on next and everyone else is interested in each person's story. Yeah. Think, think of it like a TV show and, and where, they, where they put in commercials, right? And, and that's when you stop here and go back here mm -hmm. and then stop here and go back here. It's like, it's like you went to a commercial break and you came back to the other story. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and, if, and don't try not to get into a combat situation with the player. You know, it's easy to get frustrated because, you know, you're going to do a dream sequence. I'm not going to sleep. No, I'm just not going to sleep. You know, well, everybody else has slept. Yeah, well, no, I'm going to, you know, okay, you got four levels of exhaustion now. You know, I mean, sometimes you just, but it's, hard, you know, you can get frustrated because they're ruining what you've planned. But if you get yourself too rigid into what you've planned, then you're going to get into, it's going to just become a, a difficult situation. First, question, He's saying that because I literally yet? did this <laughs> <laughs> about a month ago. Oh, is that where that came from? Uh, okay, oh, man. you had a question. Yes. What was your first impression when you played your first campaign? When we ran our first campaign? Played my first campaign? Well, that's when I mentioned I played it under the stars <laughs> on a camp out. And it was, the, it was all theater of the mind because it was the little brown book. There was no such thing as minis. There was none of that. It was just the, it was a little pamphlet, basically, of rules. And so it was, I mean, my, like I said, it was so new and the possibilities for imagination were so incredible that my mind, I went to bed that night and my mind was just spinning, you know. And that's when, and then I started, you know, GMing and, you know, got, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. My first game 
like I said, um, I was at a summer camp and was somehow told I wasn't cool enough because I didn't play. And so I was like, well, I've never heard of it. Teach me. And so we sat down and they put me through a scenario where I was solo and I was a halfling rogue in some kind of big underground complex. And looking back on it now, it really wasn't that special, except that it was something I'd never, ever done before. And I, like Rick, I was trapped right away. You know, I was buying stuff by the end of the summer and, you know, I was 11. Um, I, I walked through a green slime and didn't know what it was and it ate me off to my knees and they let me keep on crawling through the dungeon trying to do stuff. You know, and, and in the long run, a lot of it was really ridiculous. But in my mind at the time, it really got me. And then once I got my own stuff and began to read it and being, began to do things with friends, sometimes that's part of it too, is, is who you do it with. And one question too, y'all heard him talking about narrative dice. Do y'all know what narrative dice are? Okay, there's other games that use different types of dice. FFG is real big on that, and they use basically a 12-sided die. Fantasy flight games. <laughs> Fantasy flight me. games, yeah. Um, Star Wars is done that way. Uh, Legend Genesis. of the Five Rings, Genesis. They have a whole system. And what Genesis dice do is when you roll the die, there's success, failure, advantage, and disadvantage. And there's also uh, uh, triumph and despair. Okay, so if you, when you roll to succeed, you basically either accomplish the task or you don't. Okay, and um, so if you, roll a success, if you roll enough success, then you compare it because they create a pool of dice. And there's basically good dice and bad dice, for lack of a better term. I'm sure there's, a, you know, but there's the, so they ask you how hard it is. And you'll roll a certain number of dice depending on whether it's easy, you know, medium difficulty, very difficult and you'll roll that many dice. And those will have uh, basically disadvantage and failure symbols on them. And then you'll roll your dice, which have success and advantage and the despair and the triumph. And you roll them and they offset each other. So if you roll a success and a failure, that it zeroes itself out. The DM is not rolling against you. Right, you're, you're rolling, rolling the your dice. Difficulties. And so they narrate, and then you get despairs and triumph. Despairs would be something terrible happens, okay? Uh, triumph means something fantastic happens, and you get to introduce things into the story. So the and advantages mean that, for instance, say you swung at the barbarian. If you were doing it in D and D terms, you swung at the barbarian and you missed, but you got three advantage. Well, then maybe you missed, but even in missing, you hit the wall and it weakened the wall behind him, which caused him to maybe lose his footing. Okay. Um, and so you get an advantage, or if you missed but got a triumph, all right, then maybe you actually hit the wall, and even though you weren't successful at hitting him because you got a triumph, it knocked the wall down and it fell over, and there happened to be, you know, half a dozen hobbits or halflings in the other room, or, you know, it opens it up to, it just opens it up. Now, these two are much more experienced at running the game, so they could probably tell you more about it, but. I've actually introduced the narrative dice into my D&D campaign. So I now, whenever you roll a 20-sided die, I include one of the narrative dice that has, the, that has one success, two success, um, and then a one advantage, two advantage, and a triumph. And if you narrate, and this also helps to get people to role play. So if you, whatever you're doing with that 20-sided die, if you narrate it, then you get to roll the narrative dice along with it. And if you roll, right now I just have this, I just count the successes and the triumph. So if you use the narrative dice, you can get potentially a plus one or a plus two on the die and or a triumph. So it's just, and we do that in our podcast, uh, the D&D podcast so campaign I run? The difference here really is is that when you got like a D&D &D game or something like that, you're really rolling a dice to see if you get past a, you know, a, basically a DC, right? Versus, and, and that doesn't facilitate storytelling, in my opinion. Now, you have the right players at the table, they're going to facilitate their own story. It, it, it can if you, if you look at every situation and create a reason why you succeeded or failed. That's, you know, again, that's I'm, on the players. I missed by one, well... I didn't miss him, I hit his shield. Right. Right? Well, and that's fair. True. <laughs> but that's where that other dice system, the narrative dice system kicks back in is you have to you have to use and consume those advantages or threats or those, you know, those other things. So what it does is it puts the control of the story 
in the player's hands, not in the DM's hands. So it's really a cooperative storytelling. Which, which is one of the real points, is that in the long run, this is a story. The DM kind of arranges possibilities, but the players are really living out the story, and the dice help them some, but the players are, are creating and living the story. You're just arranging it, guiding it, giving it some shape. Okay? Okay. Yeah, and that, so there are other dice systems and game systems too, and you know, y'all can Savage explore. Worlds. Savage Worlds is another one. I don't know if y'all have played Savage Worlds. Yeah, Savage Worlds is another one. Um, and they open up lots of different possibilities. Yeah. So do you guys have any other questions that you'd like to ask? Yes? I kind of have a double question. Go for it. Um, I've read a lot of like mixed opinions about Unearthed Arcana and uh, Xanathar's Guide to Everything. What's yours? Uh, my opinion, if it's cool and fun, do it. Yeah. I mean, seriously, do I don't. Absolutely. I don't put any restrictions on players in making characters. I know there are some restrictions in like Adventures League and stuff. Like you can use Player's Handbook plus one other and stuff. I'm like, if it's published by Wizards of the Coast, even if they're play testing it, great. Let's play test it. Give them feedback. If it's really powerful yeah. or really awful, let's help tell them about it. Yeah. Um, let's not exclude that from our game because we're uncertain. Let's use it and see how cool it is. Um, I, that, that's mine. Let's... Well, I think it depends on the GM. <clears throat> yeah, Some GMs can does. handle flexibility more than others. Some, you know, they're working on that module and they want to work on the module because when you go off the rails, they have a harder time, you know, mitigating that or keeping it under control. And they're in Unearthed Arcana. And some of those, they can, you know, mystics, there's some classes and things that you can build that, like, in the game that I make, he wanted to build an inquisitive rogue that would have had a passive perception of 20, uh, investigation of perception of 20. 19. And, okay. <laughs> so, you know, he walks 20. in the room. Now, this is a... a Tell me everything. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now, I told him no, because... I one, I'm fleshing. This is a whole different world that I'm creating. So, and I don't have everything fleshed out. So, I don't want him to walk into a room and all of a sudden instantly know everything when I'm still fleshing out bits and pieces myself. So, I told him no, you know. And, and then, then he made that character. And then I day. made one that had a passive perception of 26 Seven. and a passive investigation <laughs> of 28, you know. But it was Doctor Who. I built the Doctor Who character. Then that would be hit. And I also knew that he's capable of handling that. And plus, with what we were running, Tomb of Horrors, that it was going to work out. And it turned out that the way, it didn't matter because he fell into the wrong part of the campaign. And my first camp player, which was Forrest Gump, died instantly. So. Okay. <laughs> okay, one last question for you all. Um, do you like GMing or playing better? That's... I think it depends. Uh, like, so I'm... Uh, whenever this campaign is done with Tomata, I'm running the next one, and I'm I'm doing something completely different. I'm doing an urban fantasy kind of based around uh, the Dresden Files. So just so, something super fun, kind of, but it's it's based in today's society. But uh, with that, like that for me, like running that, I'm super excited about it. But I mean, nine times out of ten, I just want to play. Like I love playing. I I, I have a lot of fun. Uh, role playing, especially, because I feel like, <laughs> and Percy knows this, I feel like if I can role play a situation, I shouldn't have to roll. Mm -hmm. Like I, I just, it's like if I can role play this to make it work, then you know, in like a conversation or whatever, then you know, maybe I shouldn't have to roll on this <laughs> because um, I roll bad. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I roll so bad. I need new Unless dice. I've got like hallway? four or five sets of dice, and they're all trash. <laughs> I mean, I, I enjoy doing both, but DMing is, it's got a siren song for me. Like, I literally, I, I'll go play a little bit, but I mean, in a week or two weeks, I'm like, get me back in the big chair. Uh, a part of that is because I don't like not being able to make the call. <laughs> <laughs> Some people like to be in control. You know? uh, and I didn't know that about myself until very recently. <laughs> Trust because me, when, when we run games that you play, we realize that very quickly. Yes. You know? uh, uh -huh. yeah, uh -huh. no, but GMing definitely is where I feel most comfortable. So for those of you that are unaware, Percy's game style legitimately was summed up at one point in time when he made a smart aleck comment. I pick the worst thing I could possibly do at the moment, and that is exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> yes. Yes, so when you asked about what you want to do when the players don't want to do anything you've planned, 
Here is your role model. <laughs> <laughs> I do it because it's been done to me so many so times. So it's his yeah. revenge. By these men. Yeah. I played all the way through high school and all the way through college. I almost never DM'd back then. Um, these days, I almost exclusively DM. And I have two or three characters I really, really like, but I DM all the time now. And I've, I've done about two and a half years worth of almost exclusively uh, Adventure League, but I'm kicking off my first, well, I suppose my second homebrew this week, which means that, you know, six months from now, I'll have some better answers to a couple of these questions. <laughs> but um, I've really enjoyed DMing a lot over the last couple of years. It's really just all I do anymore. I've, I've got characters I haven't touched in 18 months. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're they're going to have to end up being NPCs in the campaign somewhere along the line just so I can remember them. Yeah, that's we. I don't ever get to play much. Um, the thing I do love playing, um, but when you GM, I love the creative process. I love building the world um, and the writing, and it's so good for your mind, and it's a way to let your you know just. You know, unleash, you know, you've got halflings. Well, everyone has this take on halflings, um, and you have this take on halflings, or whatever it happens to be, or how magic works in your world. I like your take and, on halflings. Yeah, uh, I, I, I do too. That was one of my proudest. Basically, they're uh, um, the uh, Dothraki. Oh. Okay, in my world, the halflings are the Dothraki. Okay, um, so it, uh, and they're all tattoos and piercings and, you know. Gypsy wagons. And, yeah. 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 I really like little that. guys. Yeah. Got yeah. 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 No, no so, matter horse people. They are. They it. are. So they ride two to a horse, you know. But um, so you can do what you want in that situation. And there's rules, you know, you work within the rules. But also when you build your own world, you can be flexible with those worlds. And mine crystals play a big part. And so there's crystal magic. And so when someone says you can't do that, you don't know that I can't do that, you know? <laughs> hey, <laughs> you know? Adventure League is separate, but for the rest of the game, at the end of the day, even Jeremy Crawford will tell you, DM has final say. Mm -hmm. All right? DM has final say. You're creating something. It's part of why I like to DM, I think, is because I know that even if no one else wants to role play or if, or if people are confused or people are new, I can still make sure a story is told. And that, and that, like I said, that, that's really what it is. It's mm -hmm. telling a story. And for me, it's a healthy mix. I mean, to be honest, it's, I, I, I enjoy playing a whole bunch. doesn't matter what the game is nowadays for the most part. But, uh, and, and I guess it's because I found a good group of guys to game with here. But, that's key. Um, <laughs> but the reality is, is there's just that, and I hate to say this, every player has it. They have an itch to tell their own story. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's what it boils down to, is if you have that itch to tell your own story, then you need to be sitting behind a DM screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well, thank you guys so much for sticking around and, and listening to oh. us. You got one quick question? Um, what's homebrew? <laughs> homebrew is where you write your own stuff. Yeah. yeah it's not a published not, adventure. Yeah, it's not like a yeah, published adventure. It's not a canned story. And you, you're flexible with the rules. Or and, you at least adapt, because that's how I do yeah. my homebrew, is that, I, is that I buy stuff and then I adapt it. I combine it, I tweak it, yeah. I adjust it. I'm putting all of my own spin on yeah. it as opposed to running it straight. Yeah. Like my and, tweaked version of Tomb of Horrors today. Yeah, and the very first campaign I ever run, and I ran it all the way through, was basically, um, there used to be Dungeon Magazine and Dragon Magazine for years, they, would, they came out, and they'd have little bitty snippet adventures, you know, in there, little one-offs and things like that, and my campaign consisted, and I'd get the creative spark from these, and so I would adapt a lot of these into my overarching campaign, so one, it cut down on writing, and two, you know, here's this little building or whatever that's this real nice little, you know, there's a lich down there or whatever it is. And so I can figure out how to incorporate that into, you know, into that. So use the resources and materials. How you put it together, it's a puzzle. How you put it together is how you put it together. He ran Tomb of Horrors, which if, if you'd been through Tomb of Horrors, okay, well, I know everything, but he's got his own spin on it. All right. So you don't necessarily know everything. So, you know, again... That's the one beauty of these games is it's not a board game, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a mind, I'll, you know. Mm -hmm. One bit of advice that I'll push out there for anybody who, even if it's your first time sitting behind the DM screen, if you're not excited to tell your story, your players won't be either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's Get invested in your own story. Yep. Okay?
Thank you guys so much for joining us uh, today. It was awesome. Thanks for asking questions. Uh, yeah, we're looking forward to next year for sure. Yeah, you guys can follow uh, not, these guys uh, on Twitter at Not Working Crew. You can follow me on Twitter at Nathan underscore Key, or you can follow Tomata at TomataCast. Yeah. And we, we have YouTube and podcasts, so if you're interested in hearing kind of more of the games that we play and how we run them, uh, you can find us on YouTube at Tabletop Nerdcast or iTunes, Spotify, anywhere. You can All the links are podcasts. sitting in the descriptions of every video that we've got. Yeah, yeah. and we For have sure. stickers up here. And we do have want. stickers if anybody wants to take them. <clears throat> stickers. Or um, Google has a new app they put out last year that's just called Google Podcast. Yeah. And I can tell you that if it's out there, if you just type it in, they can find it. Any podcast, anywhere, and you can subscribe to it right there. Mm-hmm. Which is how I'm subscribed to these guys. Because yeah. as soon as Rick told me about it, I just typed it in and went, oh, that'll work. Thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Awesome. Yeah, we started our name with, that. well, that didn't work. And then we changed it to Table Not Birdcast because we realized, well, that didn't work. Didn't work. It wasn't working. You know, because you don't want to see the stuff that the name got dropped in. Yes. <laughs> across the internet. Explosions and just whatever didn't work. That's what you would get when you tried to type in. Well, that didn't Go work. So. Yeah. You know.